Hi, I'm Josh Bauer, play-by-play broadcaster for the Worcester Red Sox and Boston College basketball. My advice for a ninth grade student is to get involved. Try things, whatever it is that you're interested in or maybe you're not interested in. Give it a shot. This is the time of your life where you can try multiple things. You see what you like, you see what maybe you don't like, but you won't know it until you try it. So while you're there in high school, get involved, try different things, and you'll become a more well-rounded person. Welcome everybody to this episode of the Ninth Grade Experience podcast. We have a special guest on today that doesn't have a close connection to Emmaus High School, but does have a very distant one, but he has a connection to me. We were college floor mates and we graduated the same year from the University of Maryland in 2003. And he came through town last week or two weeks ago in his current role as the play-by-play announcer for the Worcester Woo Sox, the AAA affiliate of the Boston Red Sox. He was actually out of the booth. I was able to talk to him and I convinced him to come on to the podcast. So thanks a lot to Josh Maurer for joining us on today's ninth grade experience podcast. Chris, it's so good to be with you. I, I'm, I'm excited to a catch up with you, but I'm also excited to talk about high school because I haven't done that in years and years. I'm jogging my memory back to some really fun days. So, so Josh, every new guest we have on the podcast, we ask the same first question and uh, you don't have to identify your year, but I think for your story, I think it will be helpful to identify your year and maybe where you went to high school. We always tell that because we don't want to embarrass any guests for how old they are. But uh, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of your ninth grade experience. Sure, sure. So I, I'm a lower Marion high school grad and I came in in 1990, well, 1995 which was the 95-96 year. And at Lower Marion that year happened to be a guy by the name of Kobe Bryant, who was playing basketball as a senior. And I remember before that I had gotten to LM, when I was still in middle school, you started hearing rumors about this guy who played basketball, who was at LM at the time, and was supposed to be so good that maybe someday he could play in the NBA. And I remember thinking to myself, this is Lower Marion. I, I, there's no way that there's a basketball player that's good enough to be able to go to the NBA. But sure enough, they had started getting articles written about this guy and that scouts would come. And by the time we got there, it was pretty apparent that this guy was one of the top basketball high schoolers in the country. And I remember just walking around during my freshman year, which was Kobe's final year at LM. Remember, you walk through the hallways and you'd stop at your locker and then there'd randomly be a camera crew following around with lights and a big stick boom microphone and just following around this huge guy and it would always be Kobe and it would be a different news entity that was doing a feature on him. There was always excitement that year just because of the fact that he was around and he was getting so much attention, not just locally in the Philadelphia area, but nationally too. Uh, and, And of course, Kobe became what he became, but back then, he was like the big man on campus. He was friendly, outgoing. People loved Kobe, from the teachers to the other students. Uh, I, I remember as a freshman, when you would walk past him in the hallway, he was a guy that would smile at you. And he would say hello. It, it, it was uh, it was a guy you could you could tell he already had a sense of who he was and who he wanted to become, but he wasn't quite there yet. And I think getting to know what pre-Hollywood, pre-LA Kobe was like, was such a really interesting experience that year. So as I tried to make my adjustment to high school, and I was going through a lot of the same difficulties that I'm sure a lot of you have and will have, just adjusting to the fact that you're at the highest level of of grade schools and, and you're taking harder classes and your schedule is getting more demanding and there are more constraints on you for for your time and and social stuff friends groups of friends and making them mesh and all the things that that go on with with you when you turn from an eighth grader to a ninth grader that was happening with me too but then there was this added layer of excitement that was always happening in my high school freshman year just because of the fact that the basketball team was so good and Kobe Bryant was there 
So was there, and, and I think you'll probably take the cake for the best ninth grade story. I don't know if we've had anyone that's been able to touch uh, that kind of celebrity status in, inside of their building. But as we were talking and catching up beforehand, you actually were involved in a little bit of maybe what would become your future, what has become your future career during that ninth grade year, kind of, you know, helping out with some media stuff related to Kobe. So what was your involvement with that during your ninth grade year and, and kind of did seeing him there in the building kind of shape or kind of make you kind of go towards that idea of going into sports journalism? Well, it's a great question. They, what I ended up getting involved in as the basketball team was making a run through the district playoffs and then later the state playoffs. Somehow, I, I completely honestly don't remember how this happens. I got recommended to the basketball coach, Greg Downer, that I was a really good videographer and that they needed somebody to go with them and film the game so the team would have their, their game film that they could watch after the fact. And it was recommended to Coach Downer that I would be a good guy to do that. I don't know why, but I, I was chosen for that and would ride the bus for a few of those big playoff games that the team won. And I would be with them and I'd have my camcorder. This was uh, in 1996 at the time, pretty primitive video technology compared to what we have now. I'm sure we could take out our phones and, and have a better quality of video than what we were shooting. But I went with them, I would sit up in the stands and I would film the game. And the coach would tell me exactly how he wanted it to be framed, what he wanted me to shoot. And that's what I did. So, and, but I do remember the first time getting onto the bus with the team and Kobe walking on and coming right up to me. And I think he gave me a handshake and he said, hello, I'm Kobe. I said, Oh, hi, I'm Josh. I know. <laughs> but he was, he, he was that kind of guy. And yeah, it did. Uh, it was one of my first media experiences. Like, like you wouldn't have known at that point that he was Kobe. I think so. he was already preparing himself for celebrity status, even though you're right. He wasn't quite there yet, but, but he, he was for a 17 year old, or maybe he was 18 by then he was pretty polished. I, I'll tell you that. And he took Brandy, the actress and singer to the prom that year, the lower Marion high school prom. And there were paparazzi there because of that i mean it was this this guy for a high schooler back then in 1996 he was already a pretty big deal so you talked a little bit about this and so we'll kind of make get back to you here i know talking about we could probably do a full thing just talking about kobe and, and during your ninth grade year but did that make it any like what was the challenge that it brought to you as a ninth grade student did you feel any sort of additional pressure to kind of like acclimate yourself to the high school or was it just like I'm just going to do my thing and you just happened to be kind of in the wave there of kind of the things that were going on with him yeah uh, certainly I wanted just for myself to be able to acclimate into Lower Marion High School as effectively as possible and I already had had created in my mind a goal of trying to achieve what I've done, which has become a sports broadcaster for my career. Uh, and even by then, when I was 14 years old, I, I knew that, uh, which I know is rare and not a lot of people are fortunate enough to have that ambition. I, I did for whatever reason, that was, that was already the goal of mine. So that I, I did put pressure on myself just because I had that end game already in sight. But the fact that there was so much excitement going on at the high school, really all the time that year. I think that did just add an extra layer to what my experience was like, which was very abnormal from what a normal high school freshman gets to experience in the, in the course of an academic year. So you were able to take that freshman year. You obviously went on and, and you participated in your own sports as well, too. So when we were talking previously before we started recording, you said, I remember Emmaus High School, but you kind of vaguely remembered how the, the connection was. So Josh played volleyball when he was in high school and he did actually compete against Emmaus High School. It was 1998. So your junior year, you beat Emmaus two to one in the Northeastern Regional of the state playoffs. So you know, sometimes we have guests on that aren't connected to the school and, 
And Josh has a very, very loose connection to Emmaus High School. But he rem- he re- did remember the name when I said, I, oh, I work at Emmaus High School. And I was like, oh, I think we played them in volleyball. So, so he did actually, it wasn't here, but he did actually compete against the Emmaus High School. So I guess our volleyball team was pretty decent in 1998. And they continue to this day to be a pretty good uh, boys volleyball in the state as well, too. So you were, what else were you involved in? So obviously we know that you did media stuff as well and volleyball. What else, was there anything else that you remember being involved in in high school? Yeah, you know, immediately it, it was acting. I, I had in middle school already gotten involved in doing some of the uh, stage productions, the plays that the middle school had put on. And I, for a year, uh, was in uh, involved in drama for Laura Mary and I was in South Pacific my freshman year as one of the, uh, the lieutenants in, in the Navy. So that was my role. I remember I was involved in that. I wanted to play sports so badly. I just was not very good uh, <laughs> and, and ended up playing volleyball then for my final three years in high school because I couldn't make the baseball team. I couldn't make the basketball team. I just wasn't good enough. And I knew that. And a bunch of my friends and I decided, all right, we'll play volleyball. It was a new sport at the time. They all hit a big time growth spurt when we were in high school. I didn't. So we had a bunch of tall guys that ended up getting very, very good. And a few of which played collegiately uh, at the NCAA level. I, I was never at that point, but that was what my friend group was doing. So I was on the team and we became at Lower Marion then very, very competitive. As you said, Chris, we went to a state title game. We lost in a state semifinal game then our senior year. So we became very good and I was part of that team. And that took up a lot of my time as well, but I had, finally, by the time I was a junior, really started to figure out ways to get involved in media. And I formed a a plan. I wanted to get an internship. And I started working at the newly formed Comcast Sportsnet Philadelphia, which had opened in 1997. That was when the station first went on air. You know, the station that carries the Sixers and the Phillies and the Flyers games. Uh, I got in there somehow as a high school intern and would end up interning there for my last two years of high school. And that was another way that I was really able to kind of set the table for my career, which would come. So then obviously you, you graduate high school, you go on to the university of Maryland, which is where I know you from. Uh, you went on to do lots of different play by play and opportunities while you were there. Uh, you did our basketball team, our football team. And at that time, uh, they were the basketball team won the national championship. The football team was highly competitive. They were in the orange bowl. They were, you know, winning almost 10 games a season that time. So you kind of went from lower Marion where you had the Kobe experience to Maryland, where you had some successful athletic teams that you did cover. And, um, one of the, again, I like the getting the foot in the door thing. If you've ever heard of the show, pardon the interruption, Josh was, I believe the first intern on that show as well, too, actually did appear on the show. So if you turn on ESPN now and you see Tony Kornheiser and Michael Wilbon on Pardon the Interruption, Josh worked on that show when it was being formed. Uh, Do you remember anything about the formation of that show or even your college stuff real fast? And then we'll get into where you currently are. But, you know, I I remember it because I was there for a lot of it, seeing all the different stuff you were doing. But it's funny, I was doing some research on you beforehand and a clip came up. Uh, that you were just recently on, uh, pardon the interruption, Tony Kornheiser mentioned your name because he was rhyming all these different pictures that, that, that rhyme with Mauer and you just happened to be there, Josh Mauer announcing the game. But um, do you remember anything from that specific time frame that kind of helped, obviously all that led to where you are today, but anything specifically from that time frame? All of it. I, I had such a great experience at Maryland. I, I think back so fondly on those four years And the best advice that I can give to anybody, whether you're entering high school or whether you're entering college, I say this all the time and I truly mean it, it's just get involved. You have these years and when you're in high school and then when you go on to college, hopefully, you've got this time where you can try anything you want and you can figure out what you like, you'll figure out then what you don't like so much. But I just feel like it's such a wasted opportunity if you do go through those eight years, those eight great formative years that you have in your life and not take advantage of the opportunities that are presented to you by volunteering and signing up for different things, try different activities. And I was very lucky that I took that advice for myself back then uh, because 
you're right, especially when I went, went to college, I tried to dip my toes into the water, so to speak, for pretty much everything that I could. But my, my broadcasting at Maryland with the student radio station doing the basketball games and the football games, Chris, th those were some of the most fun experiences that I've ever had calling sports. And that includes almost 20 years now doing it professionally. The teams were good. Some of my best friends were the kids that I was broadcasting with and we would travel around the ACC. And uh, we did the games. We did them on the radio and there was no pressure. We could learn on the job. Yeah. If you messed up, you messed up. There wasn't somebody calling me out on it. So those are some of the most fun times that I had had. And that was even before I got to PTI. And it's funny that you mentioned that we're, you know, almost 20 years later here, we're on a podcast. We didn't really know what a podcast would be back then, but I do remember at the time, I, it might have been you, but they, the college radio station was starting an internet only like broadcast of different sports stuff. I don't, I forget how involved, I think yeah. you were very involved with this. And there might be, there's probably not, there's, a, there's recordings. I know that I did a show with uh, my, the best man at my wedding. His name is Josh Rothman. It was called Stutch and the Roth Dog is what we called it. And that, that may be, that's one of the early podcasts. And I know that everyone else, that all of our friend group that was involved with media, they all did shows on it as well too. So, you know, even then you were pioneering or part of a pioneering group of like doing online sports coverage, online, basically radio shows, which is pretty cool to think back on now that kind of to see where it is. And 20 years later, here we are doing it, you know, over, over a zoom call and basically doing what, what we were doing then in the, in the studio. I probably, I probably gave you your time slot. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, we, we started that. It would have been in 2001, right? Or 2002. It was definitely near the tail end of our college days. Cause I don't remember, maybe we did it for one. Yeah. One, well, that was season. me. I, you know, I was the sports director at the student radio station. It was called WMUC. And we always had to fight for airtime. Even if we wanted to broadcast a basketball game, let's say we would have to preempt somebody's regular show time slot that they would have. One of the music DJs would have to get preempted and we would have to fight for that. So finally, somebody came up with the idea. Well, why don't we just start our own separate stream? And we did. Uh, that was, and I was in charge of that. We started a separate sports web stream that was completely different from what was going over the regular FM music. And then it was like opening up a brand new world of opportunities. I, I went to all my friends and said, hey, who wants a talk show? We had 24 hours, seven days a week that we could fill up with anything we wanted. So yeah, that's where the sports talk shows came from. And, you know, it's, it's again, like you said, like making the best of those opportunities, keeping your, your ears open and all the different stuff. So you've had, so going on as we're, as you said, we're almost 20 years now as a professional play-by-play -play announcer, you have mainly focused in the new England area. Uh, you've done stuff at the university of Massachusetts. You've done stuff at Boston college. Um, but I would sure if you, people were to, to search you online, the thing that you're most known for is your baseball play-by-play -play announcing. Um, you've been with the Boston Red Sox organization now uh, for about eight years, I think it started in Pawtucket in 2014. And like we said at the beginning, you're currently the play by play person uh, for the, the Wooster Woo Sox. I had to, I keep looking down because I don't want to, you know, you were saying earlier, you have the Boston thing down. I'm, I, you know, I still have the Philly in me, so I, I don't want to make sure I get it right here. But um, so obviously 20 years is a long time for doing what you've been doing. So what have you been able to, how have you been able to maintain that for so long, especially with sports media being so, you know, up and down changing all the time? Like, what can you say to students that are listening that, you know, in your career that you've been able to learn and maintain throughout that entire time? You have to be able to adapt. You got to change with the technology. You have to change with the times. But I think the biggest thing is you have to have the right attitude. Sports is great, and there are so many people that want to make a career working within them that you're not going to get paid very much because they don't have to pay it. There's so many people that want your job. So it's extremely competitive. It's extremely mobile. You have to move wherever your job comes, and sometimes that means having to live in two different places throughout the course of a year. You go back and forth. I've always avoided trying to own furniture because of that. I don't like moving. You have to 
trying to figure out the best way to make a little bit of a salary go a long way. And uh, you have to make sacrifices within your personal life too. So it's not for everybody. I, I would say that while I've loved it, there are certain things that I wish that I could have had more normal in my life that I've been unfortunately kind of giving up on over the last two decades. But then again, I get to go to a ballpark every night and call a baseball game or go to a basketball arena throughout the, the winter and, and broadcast some of the best college basketball teams in the country. So you make those sacrifices because it's something that you love to do. And, and I've stuck with it. I, I don't think for a second that uh, I'm not lucky. I've been very fortunate to be able to have the jobs that I've gotten. But there are also times where you get frustrated and you have to fight through that and be honest with yourself when you are frustrated. All right, what's going on? What can I try to do better? How can I make things more normal in my life? Uh, would I love to be calling games on ESPN or CBS or Fox? Absolutely, but I haven't gotten there. Uh, that doesn't mean that I've been a failure, but it means that I still have work to do and there are still goals that I'm trying to aspire to even after 20 years in the business. Uh, there are still things that I have to do to try to get better at and I'm working to improve every day. That's the attitude that I try to have anyway. And sometimes I have a better attitude about it than others, Chris. But I think as uh, to kind of summarize a, a long answer there, long-winded, I know, to be able to persevere for almost 20 years in sports, I've been lucky, but I've had to work at it to be able to do it. And I think that's what you need to have. That's got to be the attitude if you want to be able to be successful. And really, that goes with anything that you try. And I think that's a great message too. I think so many times today, and I kind of have a question in related into this too, but like so many times today on the internet, we kind of see people that, you know, hot take culture and, and kind of getting your name out there. But I think a lot of people forget the grind that a lot of these people have to go through. Like, you know, they don't just show up like one day and it's like, Oh, we'll put you on the NBA finals. Like, you know, we're, we're recording this the day after the, the bucks won, but you know, you have people that are working in those jobs that have been trying to get to them for 10, 15, 20, 20 years as well, too. It's not like people just randomly show up and, you know, get to do, you know, you don't get to just randomly call game six of the NBA finals. They don't just pick random people out to do that kind of stuff. It's just one of those things where I think a lot of times kids in high school don't really get that. They don't understand like the, the things that you have to give up in order to do that. And even as a college student, maybe that was, you know, a reason that I'm no longer doing it is like, I thought about all the cool stuff you had said earlier, like, you know, you weren't very good at, at a lot of the sports and you couldn't get yourself on the teams. And I would imagine that 97% of people that are in sports media probably had the same experience where they're like, Oh, I wasn't good enough. Now, obviously there are some that are, you know, fantastic players, but it's like, you know, that grind, like staying on it day after day is, you know, you worked in Charleston, South Carolina, you worked in Trenton, New Jersey, you're in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, you're in Worcester, Massachusetts, Worcester, sorry, Worcester, Massachusetts, you know, you've done some things for the Red Sox as you know, in, in, you know, it's at points, um, you've announced games for, you know, University of Massachusetts and Amherst. And in Boston College, so you're you, you're not in the glamorous places. You're you know you're you're doing the work. You're putting the effort in. So I think that's important for for students to hear that like not everyone that graduates you know in the University of Maryland, we've had some people that we've graduated with that have gone on to do some really amazing things, but they don't just like graduate from school and hand you the ESPN job, or they don't just graduate from school and hand you the the Fox Sports job. So you have to really kind of be on the grind for that. And I think you're a great example of, of kind of that at this point. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, you're hundred percent correct. The fact that I've been able to accomplish what I've been able to do in my career, I think I really just owe that to keeping the nose to the grindstone and, and working hard and having the attitude to be willing to go anywhere that people will give me work. But, uh, you, you don't generally get it handed to you. It's very, very rare. Now, there are some cases, and sometimes if you've got a father or a mother that's in the industry, that helps, or other relatives that can help you make connections. I haven't had that, so I've kind of had to scratch and claw for anything I've gotten. But uh, I, I think just as a general rule in life, you need to realize that whatever you're going to achieve, you want to have to be able to do it based on your own hard work yourself. And hopefully nobody's gonna, probably I should say, nobody's gonna hand it to you. So 
uh, you got to have the attitude that you've got to scratch and claw for everything that you want. And then hopefully you're able to get there someday. So, you know, talking about that and, and the time and effort you put in, um, we'll start winding down here, but I did want to get the like, people to understand, like, what does a day look like for you? So you're announcing a baseball game, baseball games typically start at about seven o'clock. Um, we're talking today. It's in the, in the late afternoon um, on the second day of an eight game road trip. So I think I counted it correctly. You're, you're here for four nights, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, double header, Saturday, double header Sunday. So when you talked earlier about needing to be on the road, he's, you know, Josh is right now doing this from a hotel room. If you're watching, he's doing it from a hotel room where he'll be for the next six or seven nights, you know, no glamor there. Um, but what does a day look like for you when you're, when you're on a game day for baseball, as an example? Yeah, baseball is a great example of it. I think the lifestyle for baseball is different than just about anything else we have in American society. I've thought that for years. It's such a different animal, even than basketball or football, for example, because you play every day. And, and that's just the way it is. But you can get into a great routine. For me, my routine is generally wake up somewhat early. I, the older I get, the earlier it is that I end up waking up, although I don't keep teacher's hours, Chris. And so I can't claim that I have as early of an alarm that goes off as you do, I'm sure. But I try to get up and I'll do a lot of reading. I'm a voracious reader when it comes to trying to do research for the team that I'm working for at the time. I don't want to know just everything about my team, which is the Red Sox AAA club, but I want to know everything about the Boston Red Sox. I want to know everything about all the teams in the American League East because I need to be well-versed to talk about anything that might come up. Baseball is a long game. I'm sure that most oh, of the yeah. people this know that. Yeah, you're if you play in less than three hours, that's a rarity these days. So you're going to have to fill a lot of time. So it's not just calling balls and strikes and hits and homers and ground outs. It's filling that time with interesting tidbits, information, stories that I'm going to have to unearth throughout the course of the day. So I do. I take the morning to read. I try to work out. I think it's important to stay in shape. And uh, the older I get, the more challenging that can be. So I'm, I'm doing my best to every day get some exercise in, eat some food, write some emails, uh, listen to other broadcasters. That's another thing that I love to do. I try to listen to other people who do what I do to see what I like and maybe what I don't like. I listen back to my broadcasts. Maybe for the night before, I'll put on five minutes of what I had done just to hear if I'm falling into any bad habits. Or if I did something that I liked, maybe I'll do that again. Uh, even after I've done thousands of baseball games, but I still fall into bad patterns, I think, from time to time. And you have to make sure you can catch that before it becomes too prevalent. Uh, and then about four or five hours before first pitch, when we're on the road, is when I'll end up going over to the ballpark. And in the pre-COVID times, that would be the time that I'd head into the clubhouse with the teams or onto the field during batting practice talk to the coaches, talk to the players. Those are where you really get the best stories. Unfortunately, this year and last, we don't have that kind of access anymore. And so I feel like that's a big part of my job that's been taken away. Uh, it's harder to get to know the players on a personal level. And, and you're not as well-versed when you don't have that intimate knowledge of them. But we have to do what we have to do and, and try to overcome that and, and come up with different ways to keep informed and then keep your listeners entertained. Uh, and so that's what I've done. Um, I have a scorebook that I keep that has every one of our this year 130 games in it chronologically for the whole season. And I keep notes, I keep anecdotes, information, and that's always updated. So if I need to find something, I can go back and get it at a moment's notice. And then doing the game itself, that's the easy part. Once you're prepared, then it's just taking that knowledge that you've already gained for the day and putting it into action and, and calling a baseball game. Baseball is, as I said, it's a different beast. If you think about it, when you're listening to a basketball game on the radio, for example, 90% of the time, there's something happening. And so the guy doing the play-by-play, -play, which is what my job is, 90% of the time, all you're really doing is describing what's happening in front of you. So you see a guy dribbling, you see a guy rebound, shoot, pass, whatever. You just describe it. And you have to come up with different ways to describe it. But in the, on the whole, it's not terribly challenging i'll tell you baseball 90 percent of the time nothing is happening it's yeah. the complete opposite and i don't mean that in a derogatory way towards the sport it's just the way that it is so for those 90 
percent of the three and a half hours we're on the air, I got to find a way to make it entertaining without having the action to describe. So uh, preparation, that's a very, I know, long-winded way of answering your question, but the preparation that I do all during the day leading up to when the game actually starts, that's what makes a good broadcast in my opinion. And that's the kind of thing, again, you don't see that. You don't see the preparation. I actually had a chance to see the notebook. So I, had, I know that it exists. Um, and the notes that are in there, like that's not when you're listening to a game or watching a game and you hear people that are so smooth and talking about it, you don't like people don't think about all the work that goes into that. I know football is entirely different too, but like I've seen football announcers and they have charts and they have people that are spotting stuff for them and they have notes about everything and they have all these different ways of keeping track of all this stuff. So when you, when you sit down and watch any sporting event or even like the Olympics coming up or whatever people are into, um, it, there's so much background work that goes into that, that I think is really, I think it's a good message to also send to students that like, you know, you put in all this work for the end product to look so smooth. And if you don't put in all the work, then obviously you're not going to be able to talk about things off the fly. Like the night that I saw you at the ballpark, you told me about the center fielder. There was the number one prospect in their organization that was going to get called up soon. And I believe three or four days later, he's now on the Red Sox batting lead off in Yankee. While well, he was going to play, he was in, you know, in Yankee stadium. And I was said to my son, I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's the guy yep. that Josh told us about. So again, like having these, you know, little pieces of information to be able to give to the viewer or the, or the, the listener, I think is crucial for, for what you're doing. So I think it's really awesome. You're able to do that. So I have one final question to ask, and I think this is kind of like a internet culture question. And I, I was looking this up and I was wondering, like, how do you deal with people that are negative towards what you do? I, I couldn't find much online of like people saying like, Oh, you know, Josh doesn't do this well, or Josh is always favoring this person. Or, you know, when you listen to these national announcers, it's always like, you know, so-and-so announcer hates Philadelphia. So-and-so announcer hates this team or that team. How do you kind of take that in stride of being like, well, I just do my, the job that I can do the best way I can do it. And I don't, I can't worry about all the negative, what the negative things people say about it is. It's a great question. And I have been, I guess in many ways fortunate because I haven't been at the level where you deal with that as much as the Joe Bucks and the Jim Nances of the world, I'm sure have to, but there is some of it. And a lot of it in my world comes from either players, families, or friends, people who are intimately involved with the athletes that I am broadcasting for. And maybe they hear things in a certain way that I didn't intend them. And over the years, that's caused some friction. The best thing that I could say about it is, A, you have to, as hard as it is, you got to have very thick skin when you're in a position where people are going to say mean things about you, because there's no real way to turn it off. It's just the unfortunate reality of our world these days. Unless you're going to crawl into a hole and never come out to see the sunshine, you, you yeah, you can try to stay off of social media, or you can try to not go to the internet as much, but the reality is if, if people are saying things negatively about you or positively, you're going to hear them. It's going to get back to you in some way, shape or form. And so you just have to keep in mind that it's generally a very vocal minority that are the people that are saying those things. The majority of people in our society are not the ones that are being the loud mouths out on Twitter or on Facebook or whatever it might be. Uh, I, I did, you mentioned this, Chris, earlier, do some Boston Red Sox major league games I've broadcasted in the past. And, and that's when I've had the most exposure to a wide audience. And I'll tell you, it, it's not great when you do get a lot of negative feedback. You don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear people telling you how bad you are at your job that you've worked for your whole life to get to. So uh, I, I think the best thing to do is just try to tune it out as best you can and realize that the majority of people probably think you're doing just fine. And there's going to be some loud uh, minority group that say, all right, well, I don't like this, but those are the people that tend to speak up the most. And you just have to put that into the perspective that, uh, that it is, that it's not the majority of the folks and keep doing the best that you can, because really at the end of the day, you can't control it. You do the best job that you've trained yourself to do. And hopefully that's good enough for most people. 
And I think that's a great message to end on here is, you know, you've given a lot of great tips for like ninth grade students, for any high school student, even for adults that are listening as well too, to kind of put the work in and, you know, you can only do what you can do. You control what you can control. And that's, you know, your preparation for the games. And if, you know, the random person that's going to respond on an online platform doesn't like the way that you announced, you know, the game winning home run or didn't give it enough uh, emphasis for something else, you can, you can't really control how other people think that. And I think that's a great message for, you know, students, especially now that are on social media all the time and kind of, they feel like their lives always out there and people are judging them. So I think that's a great, great spot to end it. So we have to let Josh get ready to go to the ballpark tonight. So he's at Coca-Cola park. Uh, he will be at Coca-Cola park uh, to announce tonight's uh, game. Uh, so I appreciate Josh taking some time out for us uh, before he heads over to there. It was great catching up with him. Uh, I, as I hear people say all the time, podcasts are great excuses to talk to people. And uh, this is a great excuse to get in touch with Josh and to have him, you know, give some great messages and, and career readiness information to our, our students here. So Josh, thanks a lot for uh, taking some time out today. So if they wanted to follow you, uh, I know on Twitter, you're Josh Maurer, M-A-U-R-E-R-P-X-P -E on, on Twitter. Um, and then obviously they can go, is it woosocks.com or, or is it? Yeah, woosocks.com. That's the, the team, the baseball team that I work for. And I do Boston College's men's basketball games. So if you're an ACC basketball fan and you're ever jonesing for a little radio play-by-play, -play, you can catch that out throughout the winter. Uh, and in addition to various other entities that I work for. So I try to keep my, I, I try to keep my hands in a lot of different areas. The more, the more work I can do, the better, right, Chris? Yeah. You got to keep up, keep up on that game. And that's why I'm, you know, it's funny getting back into all these years after being in journalism, this you doing the podcast here has allowed me to do that. So I appreciate having the opportunity to catch up with you and uh, thanks a lot. And you can look for, you know, just like I did, you can see Josh up in the press box at, at Coca-Cola park. If you're there in the next couple of days or whenever he comes through in the future, but thanks a lot for taking the time out today, Josh. It was great talking to you and to all your listeners, Chris. Thank you so much for having me.